What if the world was holding its breath, waiting for you to take that place that only you can fill? I'm inspired by this David White quote because I've been battling with these questions. Is wanting to create purposeful impact a matter of pure entitlement? Is it narcissistic or just blatantly naive to pursue that? You might consider me as lucky because whenever I didn't follow my calling, I was in unbearably much pain. This meant, on the one hand, my life was always filled with meaning. But on the other hand, it meant I spent a lot of time in so much pain. And when I was at the crossroads back in the years of returning into management consulting after a 100K elite MBA, doubling down on my idea and at the time hobby project to build a network of truly purpose-driven leaders of my generation felt like a direct ticket to stupidity land. Today, and otherwise, of course, sure, I wouldn't be here, uh, I feel it wasn't. I will never regret having to live through the fear of losing our business through COVID, or the tears of joy while being flash mobbed by our team and around 40 alumni at some of the reunions that we had. Hence, I want to give some solid reasons as to why it's neither narcissistic nor naive to pursue a purpose-driven career and leave us with three questions that can help us identify what that could mean for each of us. For organizations, the case of a fulfilled workforce is overwhelmingly good. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> Worldwide, the top quartile of the organizations with the most engaged workforce outperforms the bottom quartile on almost any metric. Their profitability and sales are about a fifth higher. Fluctuation is up to two thirds lower. Absenteeism is down by 41% and safety incidents even by 70%. So far, so good, but is trying to pursue a fulfilled work life also a good idea for us humans? Or are we simply better off opting for the simpler and, and far less demanding relationship with work and one of mere provision. After all, especially if you have a good career already, <laughs> um, trying to realize your calling means to put our hearts at risk. Because failure in what I'd call truly heartfelt work feels worse than just some sort of mechanical malfunction it is really some sort of failure in our quintessence. So does it make sense to prioritize purpose even over money? Now, first of all, let's admit that above that magic and much quoted cutoff point of around 75,000 US dollars per year, more money doesn't necessarily make us happier, but statistically, for sure, not having any money makes us very, very unhappy. <laughs> so you knew that before, right? But let's filter out entrepreneurs, those who opted for an entrepreneurial career in the long run. Not only are they healthier in terms of diabetes, obesity, mortality rates, for instance, they're also happier. Across the globe, they report better levels of satisfaction when it comes to job satisfaction, relationship quality, and wait for it, work-life balance. And what is more, life satisfaction only seems to rise up to an extent where as an established entrepreneur, you're significantly happier than your employee counterparts, no matter what you earn. And last but not least, we're all doing it. We all, to a large extent, prioritize meaning over money, even your parents. As a matter of fact, as we age, purpose becomes an increasingly bigger contributor to work happiness, whilst money declines in importance. So this is by far not an innovation, an invention of the millennial generation. 
in today's world, I believe that knowing your calling and following it, mastering the art of making money with your life purpose is decisive as to whether you're having a great life or just a life. Having worked on this with hundreds of millennial change makers, I found that there are three questions, or let's say three question areas that we all have to get aligned on in order to build truly purpose-driven work. So grab your pen and paper, and if you like, join me on this experiment and doing some, some research into the matrix, that, that amazing software that each of us has created between their two years. And for the first question, I'm inviting you to sit down, close your eyes, and imagine a situation where all of these annoyances of the past weeks, the small and big fears, the small and big moments of sadness just disappear so that there is space for a large sense of quiescent yet grounded wholeness to emerge. And just zoom out a little and zoom out even more to imagine, imagine that lifeline from birth to death of that life of yours. And ask yourself that question, what is that person pursuing? That person who is me. What is that person's longing? A longing to heal. A longing to stand up for something. A longing to make say, things smoother, faster, better. What is there more of in this world? What great value is there more of in this world because you follow your calling? So if you like, answer the first question, and that is, no matter where I go, what is it that I am instinctively creating? And if you like, open your eyes and write that down. I like to call this the sponsoring pursuit. That one thing you generate, reproduce, create, regardless of where you are. It tends to show in your decisions, in the kind of conversations you lead, but it sure shows up in three things. The team you're surrounded with, the leadership you radiate, and the culture you build as a result of it. So let's think first about the team. What are these kind of colleagues that you would love to work with, that you would be inspired to work with? 40% of our work happiness is driven by interpersonal relationships. So let's think about what it is that we seek so that we spot them, these kind of guys, when we meet them. We tend to think that in order to attract the best people, we have to pay top salaries or put bean bags and green smoothies into our company cafeteria. But I like to think that the best people resonate with us because of what we are building. So I have this image that each of us is running around with an umbrella. And under this umbrella, it rains exactly the energy that it, we're putting out to all of our surroundings all of the time, no matter where we are. So when you are a force of what you instinctively create, what does it rain under your umbrella? Empowerment, peaceful reflectedness, or are things being very dynamic, fast, boom, 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 boom? <laughs> Whether you want it or not, what it rains under your umbrella, that's your leadership style. That's the culture you're going to give rise to no matter where you go. And it's simultaneously the reason why people join you or why they run away from you. 
The second question is, how does what you instinctively create relate to the world you are in? For this, you want to imagine your stage, your role, and the audience. So as for the stage, think about the industries, organizations, products, and services that you are in deep resonance with. And pick a role that you seek to play in this. What are the things you love doing and that you are at the same time good at, be that talent or acquired skill? Are you the artist who masters and perfects their skills, be that you know, Excel sheets or people management, doesn't really matter. Are you the preneur who, who takes charge of running things and getting the money in? Or are you the cheerleader who you know, loves to listen and support so that people can do the things that they are best at. And also think about the audience, the people you serve, those who need what you have to offer. Put simply, what is the hell they are in? Because they haven't met your product or service yet. And what heaven do you catapult them in afterwards? That difference between hell and heaven is exactly the problem you solve for them. And if defined well, it's something you can likely get paid for. And the third question is, what is the lifestyle you wish to cultivate? For instance, are you and your five children living in a big house on the countryside? Or are you jet-setting between London and Kuala Lumpur? This means you want to think about your annual expenses. And please do not leave out taxes, insurance payments, or pension. And please do also not leave out the time requirements you have for yourself, your social life, and your hobbies. You also want to be clear on how you're going to finance this. A full-time job a part-time job and freelancing, or a part-time job and a passion project. Maybe you have a scholarship lined up, or maybe it is time for you to found your own organization. So here we are. These are my three questions. Hopefully I could convince you that following your calling does not at all have to be rash but it's really more an expression of how you navigate your world. When going through these questions, maybe some of them will end up being blank. Maybe you'll say, oh, my answers contradict each other. They don't match up. Or how on earth am I supposed to know all of this by now? And you don't have to, but the better you know, the easier it will be for you to build work that inspires and fulfills you in the long run. So hopefully by now you will agree, knowing your calling is an asset, following it an even bigger one. The world is indeed waiting for you.